Hello, and welcome to this Federal Society webinar call. Today, July 24th, 2023, we host a litigation update in Buetner Harso versus Baltimore Lutheran High School Association, a case involving a reach and application of Title IX. My name is Kayla Kleist, and I'm an assistant director of practice groups here at the Federal Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. The Federal Society takes no position on particular legal or public policy issues. Now, in the interest of time, I'll keep my introduction of both our speakers brief, but if you'd like to know more about either of our guests today, you can access their impressive full bios at fedsoc.org. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Mary Margaret Beecher, who is Vice President and Executive Director at the Napa Legal Institute, which found the amicus brief in this case. Ms. Beecher joined Napa Legal in 2019, serving most recently as the organization's senior counsel. Before working at Napa Legal, Ms. Beecher was an associate attorney with a Chicago-based law firm which specialized in nonprofits and tax-exempt organizations. Prior to serving the nonprofit sector, Ms. Beecher focused her career in finance, working with the CME Group and Dimensional Fund Advisors on financial compliance matters, implementation of U.S. sanctions programs, and cybersecurity risk management. Also joining us today is our moderator, Ms. Amanda Sauls, who is an associate with Morgan Lewis, where she represents clients on a variety of litigation matters. Before joining Morgan Lewis, she worked on civil and criminal trial and appeals as a law clerk to Judge Andrew Oldham on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit and Judge Reed O'Connor in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Texas. And I'll leave it there. Uh, one last note, throughout the panel, if you have any questions, please submit the buy in the question and answer feature likely found at the bottom of your Zoom screens so they'll be accessible to our speakers when we get to that portion of today's webinar. With that, thank you all for being with us today. Ms. Sauls, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Kayla. And thank you, Mary Margaret, for joining us today. Uh, while Mary Margaret and the rest of Napa Legal have their fingers on the pulse of religious liberty litigation generally, especially as it applies to nonprofits and tax exempt organizations, she's uniquely well qualified to tell us today about the Bettner Hartso appeal that we'll focus on as Napa Legal filed an amicus brief in this case, as Kayla said. So, Mary Margaret, I have several questions for you, but depending on timing, I'm hoping we might be able to get to some listener questions as well. So listeners, if you have any questions during the call, please feel free to send those in Q&A feature um, rather than the chat, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. So Mary Margaret, would you mind just starting us off with a high level overview of the factual background of this case, um, which some of our listeners may not be familiar with? Yes, definitely. Thanks, Amanda, and thank you for the introduction, Kayla. Um, this case, Bender Harto has received a lot of attention, um, specifically for um for a case at this stage in its in the like procedural process. Um it is a case in Baltimore. It was brought by five former students of an independent Christian high school that had 501 that has 501 C3 tax exempt status. Um the case was brought um the kind of substance of the allegations was that there was sexual harassment taking place at the school in a certain period and that the administration um didn't act like aggressively enough to put an end to that. Um, so the focus, I think, of a lot of the interest in the case comes from the fact that one of the counts was made under Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. Um, these provide that no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in or deny the benefits of or be subjected, subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Um, the reason this, this is such an interesting count in this case is that the school was not receiving any federal grant during the period in question. So um, the, only, the only basis for the coverage of Title IX would be um, the school's tax-exempt status. And that's a pretty radical understanding of, of what tax-exempt status is to say that that's federal financial assistance triggering this and potentially other um, regulatory programs that, that would not be otherwise applicable to a school like um, like Baltimore Lutheran. Um, so back in um, July 2022, I believe it was when this started, um, the school filed a motion to dismiss um, or in the alternative move for summary judgment on the count of the applicability of Title IX, um, just because it was not a recipient of any federal grants during the relevant period. Um, but on July 21st, um, the district court denied the motion for summary judgment and held that the school was a federal financial aid recipient um, solely by virtue of its 501c3 status. Um, and that, that's just against a lot of the, the weight of precedent. Um, 
And I think that's why we see, and we'll get into this later, the interest of so many um, Amici in this case. Um, so the school filed for reconsideration or in the alternative an interlocutory appeal, um, the district court granted the latter. And we saw numerous Amici filing already in favor of the grant of the interlocutory appeal. And then when that appeal was granted, um, additional Amici filing in, in favor of reversal of the district court's opinion. Um, and then I wanna note too, before we proceed too far that um, Title IX of the Education Amendments, it does have a religious exemption, um, which provides that if um, the, the application of Title IX would contradict a religious organization's beliefs, um, the organization can be exempt to the extent that that conflict exists. Um, so what's really at stake here, there definitely are serious religious implications, but I think um, the sort of the threshold most direct implication of this case would really be the administrative burden, general entanglement issues, um, and just concern of this analysis spreading to other um, federal financial assistance programs and the related um, the related oversight and regulations. Yeah, it's so as you mentioned, uh, many see this as a pretty radical interpretation, but what exactly were uh, Judge Bennett's rationales for concluding that the court had jurisdiction and that the claim could proceed in light of 501c3 status and, and Title IX? Sure. Um, so I, I pulled a quote from um, the district court's opinion that I think really is, is where a lot of the reaction in the, um, the practitioner community came from. Um, the the district court um, judge held that a number of opinions confirm that an institution qualifies as a recipient of federal assistance under Title IX, even if it did not apply for aid or if the aid is indirectly provided. Um, so again, like we talked about earlier, he's broadly construing the meaning of financial assistance to cover almost any economic benefit, including this kind of almost passive um, receipt of 501c3 status. Um, and just briefly, I want to walk through four of the cases that were um, determinative in, in the judge's opinion. Um, I'll start with kind of the least persuasive and then kind of advance to where I think is probably the strongest argument in favor of his position. Um, he references a case called Cannon, which um, in, in dicta cited two district court opinions from one from 1970s and one from the 1980s, which said that um, tax exemption is federal financial assistance, but uh, in, in both cases, um, the tax exemption was accompanied by some more substantive financial assistance, so like a direct grant or some other um, some other more active um, interaction between the exempt organization and the government. Um, and then in the case Smith, um, the court, again, I, I viewed this as dicta, um, said that entities that receive financial assistance, whether directly or through an intermediary, and that clause, just that clause, whether directly or through an intermediary, um, the district court, court here in Bettner um, constructed like basically a syllogism that said, because direct aid is not the only type of federal financial assistance that triggers the applicability of Title IX, um, therefore federal 501c3 status must be, just because not all is some, like it's a little bit, I found it a little bit unpersuasive. And I think I think a lot in the, um, a lot of practitioners in this area did as well. Um, and then the third case cited was Grove City College, um, which held that if a student receives federal financial aid for higher education that is passed on to an educational institution, um, the recipient institution is subject to federal Title IX oversight. Um, and that's pretty well known. Um, that's, I think, the that's where we see like a school, something like Hillsdale College, where they're they're opting out of even having their students receive federal funding for their higher education um, because it's it's settled, kind of settled law that if a student receives certain federal, I believe it's like a FAFSA loan, then the recipient school would also be subject to um, that that whole regulatory regime. Um, so that's, I mean, that's settled law, but it's, it's really not particularly analogous to Baltimore Lutheran's case. Um, and then finally, we get to what I think is probably the most formidable of the contrary authority cited for the holding in Bettner, um, which says that um, in, in, in this is the Reagan case, Reagan versus, I um, can't remember the exact name of the other party, but it's like taxation. Um, and it held that the prohibition on lobbying by a 501c3 was not unconstitutional. Um, that and, and then again, the, in the holding, it 
the court's exact language, and this is a Supreme Court case, um, held that tax exemptions and tax deductibility are a form of subsidy administered through the tax system. Um, that's that's a strong statement um, that did come from the Supreme Court, and I think that's probably where um, that's probably where the basis for the district court is that it's like its arguments are at their strongest um, in the context of Reagan. But again, I think um, even that is really not is not the prevailing um, view of 501c3 status. Thank you for walking through each of those cases. I think that gives very helpful context for both where the district court is coming from and likely what we'll see from the appellees in their response brief. Because briefing is still ongoing, we've yet to see their arguments, but um, better uh, Lutheran or um, Baltimore Lutheran rather, rather has already filed its brief. So what are some of its main arguments in favor of reversal? Sure, um, there are a lot of textual arguments here, which I think um, it can, be, it can um, be fun for anyone who's not practicing with exempt organizations, but is just interested in um, textual interpretation. Um, a lot of the MEC also raised similar textual arguments um, that um, the implementing regulations for Title IX, they, they give a laundry list of what types of aid constitute federal financial assistance as almost like a term of art within the context of Title IX. And exempt status is never mentioned. Um, and then there are other, if the agent, agencies do not discuss tax exempt status as a grant, and even um, the forms themselves that are used to apply for tax exempt status are called the application for recognition of tax exempt status. So we don't really discuss exempt status as something that's granted or awarded. It's, it's just recognized. Um, so that was the first piece of the argument. And then um, we'll get into this a little bit more later, but there is... Um, there are a number of spending clause kind of arguments, which um, is that the any legislation that is given under the spending clause um, has a higher um, like burden of clarity, so to speak, um, because it's like it's analogous to like a common law contract between the government and the recipient, and so because it's analogous to contract, there has to be that meeting of the mind, and so you cannot accidentally become subject to conditions for federal funding without realizing it. Um, so, and, and in this case, I think um, we'll get into this later, but some of the MEC and ours included point out that um, Baltimore Lutheran actually had exempt status before Title IX was even enacted. So obviously there was no meeting of the minds. And this was not something that was contemplated. Um, and then finally, um, Baltimore Lutheran raises um, harm arguments just about what a hardship it would be for exempt organizations if um, this broadly applicable kind of high, heavy administrative burden were imposed on organizations um, that, you know, they're very small, they, they don't have a lot of overhead staff to handle um, the scale that would be needed to implement Title IX. Um, and I mean, this is a policy, those are policy arguments, but they're also strong legal arguments in the sense that um, this would, the district court's interpretation here would revolutionize, absolutely revolutionize the exempt organization sector. So I think we do have Scalia's point from um, the EPA case where you've got an elephant in a mouse hole here. I, I don't, I don't think Congress would revolutionize the sector without some serious debate. Um, so those are the three primary arguments, textual, um, common law contracts, the spending clause, and then finally the harm argument. Um, those are, those are the three that I think Baltimore Lutheran emphasizes. In its, um, in its brief. Great. Well, uh, your organization, the Napa Legal Institute, was one of 12 amici who appear in this case, including the Institute for Justice, the St. Thomas More Society, the National Business Officers Association, and a variety of educational associations. You've obviously touched on the policy implications here, but if you could just speak directly to why do you think that uh, this case garnered so much attention from associations like Napa Legal? Well, Yes, um, this case did. It, it garnered a lot of attention. And I think the reason for that is that um, this case, uh, I hate to use militaristic metaphors, but this case is kind of a battle in an ongoing war, so to speak. Um, and a lot of the times it's kind of an esoteric war. Like we practitioners talk a lot about um, tax exemption theory. So like what are the justifications for tax exemption? And that's an ongoing debate. And 90% of the time it's a little bit esoteric. But then during the 10% of the time when it does come into the, become the focal point of litigation like this, you understand why it's, um, why it's so important because it's, it's absolutely outcome determinative here. Um, and I'll just briefly, um, for the benefit of our listeners, 
walk through um, four of the main justifications for tax exemption theory and like why that's kind of the issue in the crosshairs here in this Baltimore Lutheran case. Um, the first is, is what came, comes through in um, the judge's opinion here, and that's tax subsidy theory. And that theory views tax exemption as a, as a tax expenditure. So anytime under this um, perspective, anytime there's a 501c3, the government is kind of granting money that was that was that the government was entitled to to, to um, go to this program. So it's kind of the government deserves to be um, receiving a portion of this nonprofit, this exempt organization's revenue, and it's foregoing that that revenue in order to further some public objective, um, some policy objective. And that view, it's it, it really it starts with tax, but it also goes to policy as well because along with that. Um, with that perspective, you say, okay, well, if, this, if the government is granting, then they deserve to have a say in policy. They deserve to have a say in how this organization is run, what it's doing, what it's talking about. Um, and so you can see quickly this becomes not just a tax issue, but a very, very considerable First Amendment issue for all of civil society. And so I think that's why you see so much um, 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 engagement from the Amici. And then, um, on the contrary perspective, and this is advanced by a lot of the Amici, are, um, are three theories of, of justification for tax exemption that cut the other way. Um, the first is the tax base theory. And under this view, um, it's just that it, it basically says that charitable activity isn't part of the tax base, only um, for profit, only private benefit um, type activity belong um, in the realm of taxable activity. And so um, the activity of an organization like Baltimore Lutheran just isn't subject, it's just not taxable. Um, the second one is the historical perspective, which is kind of similar to the tax-based theory, but um, it, it looks at the fact that going back all the way to Samaria, to Babylon, um, churches, religious organizations have been exempt from the applicable tax regime. It's, it's just viewed as kind of a different realm you have the temporal realm and then you have these religious activities and, and it's just not subject to civil government in the same way um, that like commercial activity would be. Um, and then um, finally, there's, um, I'm, missing, <laughs> I'm missing it in my notes. Um, finally, there's, oh yeah, there's the autonomy argument, which is that religious activity is something, again, altogether different from um, like commercial activity, more secular activities. And so it's, it's, not really, I guess, the government's business. It's kind of completely out of the scope altogether of, of what would be taxed. Well, there's obviously a lot there. Are there any arguments that Napa Legal uh, specifically focused on or just where, you know, walk us through your brief, essentially? Yeah, so we um, we file our brief through pro bono counsel. Um, so I'm really standing on their shoulders here as a, as a non-litigator in um, recounting some of the arguments. Um, but ours really focused on the text and structure of title, both Title IX and um, 501c3. So just looking at the ordinary meaning of federal financial assistance, um, looking at the context of both um, 501c3 and Title IX, um, and then the history of how these regulations have been administered. Um, those, those were some of the core. And then as well, the administrative regulations implementing Title IX um, we also emphasize, and then finally, um, Supreme Court precedent on this issue. Um, and just to build this out a little bit more, um, we we included as well like the Scalia view of the elephant in mouse holes that um, it w a congressional kind of revolution of 501, the entire tax exempt sector would not be done inadvertently kind of by implication. Uh, it, it would be done affirmatively as we the fruit of a lot of debate. And so it seems very unlikely that that was the um, that that's the meaning of Title IX. And then also the enforcement mechanisms are not built into the statutory framework of Title IX. So if the if the amount of oversight that sort of the district court's opinion would imply was actually expected, there would have been a lot more um, oversight built into the tech, tech of the statutory framework and the implementing regulations. Um, and then finally. The Department of Justice's Title VII and Title IX manuals, um, Title VII, Title VI, excuse me, is somewhat relevant just because it's parallel um, in many ways. They're both 
um, statutes that impose non-discrimination obligations on recipients of federal financial assistance. Um, their legal manuals on both um, on both of these acts um, do not list exempt status as um, as a form of aid that would trigger um, the coverage and the um, regulatory oversight that the district court's opinion suggests might might be applicable. Okay, so that's all focused on on your one brief. Um, I believe there are seven briefs total, um, so including Napoli's Eagles and uh, including. Baltimore Lutherans. There are five other amicus briefs. I don't know uh, how familiar you are with those, but do you know, are there any argument, standout arguments that you think may influence the Fourth Circuit um, from those other amicus briefs? Yes. Um, so the arguments advanced by the amici fall really into four categories, um, some of which overlap kind of what we've talked about. Um, the first is the agency interpretation. Um, in the years subsequent to 1972, um, when Title, Title IX was enacted, um, no agency has attempted to in, enforce Title IX against exempt organizations that don't have any other form of federal financial assistance. So clearly, the, the agencies don't see this meaning. Um, and that, I think, is, is relevant to what the text, like a correct interpretation of the text. Um, the second would be that this is settled precedent. Um, with the exception of one or two district court cases, um, uh, exempt status has never been viewed as an affirmative grant of financial assistance um, in our jurisprudence. So um, this really kind of doesn't have that type, type of historical support. Um, and then second would be interpretation and application of spending clause legislation principles, um, which really go back a little bit more to common law contract principles as well. Um, that these are offers of federal funding conditioned on the recipient's adherence to um, particular policy obligations, particular um, non-discrimination or oversight or other conditions of the funding. Um, and that needs to be clear and unambiguous. Um, it cannot be uh, by implication. It can't be sort of understood. It has to be a very clear thing. Um, so I'll contrast this, for example, with the Paycheck Protection Loan. Um, those are those are kind of universally understood to be federal financial assistance. And in the application itself for a paycheck protection loan, there is a litany of um, conditions that the recipient certifies to. Like, I understand that these are my obligations. Um, you're, you're subject to traditional audit requirements. You're subject to um, a number of different like policy and non-discrimination obligations for the duration of the loan. Um, and there's nothing like that on the application for 501c3 status. Um, there's nothing like that on the 1023. Um, and then finally, there's some very persuasive arguments on um, the, the, just like how serious this impl the implications of this interpretation would be um, with one of the MEC actually saying this case threatens the existence of nonprofits. Um, one of them notes that I think several thousand nonprofits within the association's purview have fewer than 50 students. And so hiring like a full-time Title IX coordinator would, would make the education offered by those schools unaffordable for the majority of the families that they serve. Um, so that kind of goes back to that elephants and mouse holes, I think, perspective of um, this couldn't be what was meant um, because, it, because of the context in which the legislation was enacted. Definitely. And, and I'm sure we'll get further into that, just broader implications. Um, so it sounds like there are many persuasive arguments in favor of reversal. And uh, notably, there weren't any amici that appeared in support of the plaintiff's appellees, the one below. So it seems like they have their work cut out for them and responding to all seven briefs. Um, when is their response brief due? Um, the response brief is due on August 4th. Okay, great. So we don't have long to wait. Um, well, up until now, we've been talking about Bender Hart so specifically. And before taking a step back and getting further into the potential implications of this case, I want to just remind listeners that they can send any questions via the Q&A feature. We already have a few lined up, but I will be getting to those soon. So if you do have any questions, feel free to just submit those. But looking at the um, bigger picture, what effect do you think an affirmance in this case would have on independent educational institutions? Um, it would be... It would be, I mean, the administrative burden is the first, I think, that comes to mind. It would be an additional expense that most schools did not contemplate. Um, many smaller schools intentionally avoid 
federal financial assistance at this time uh, just because they don't they cannot handle um, some of the administrative and oversight regulations that go along with it. Um, but I think there are also policy um, considerations as well and uh, autonomy considerations, and these are raised in a lot of the MEC um, that the schools um, they're all accredited, so they have oversight through the accreditation process and imposing federal oversight in addition to um, the more tailored kind of oversight through accreditation could interfere with the school's mission. It could interfere with their understanding of the best way um, to go about delicate issues and to create the community that they're seeking um, to create, um, that's their mission to create. Um, so I think, I think those are the primary um, implications on educational organizations specifically. And are there broader impacts? I'm assuming so, given the amount of amici and um, the considerations you've already discussed, but what are some of the broader implications, ramifications on 501c3s generally that we may expect? Um, well, I think there are a few there are a few cases ongoing that I think would be impacted if if uh, Baltimore Lutheran District Court opinion stands or is upheld. Um, one I believe settled is the um, Valley Christian Academy case. Um, I believe that that settled um, earlier this year. Um, but that case also was a case about um, whether a school's position on, um, I want to say it was whether they could have a co-ed football team. They, they preferred to have, for, because of their like Christian understanding of the identity of men and women, had separate sex distinct uh, athletic teams. And a student sued under Title IX saying, you know, that this sex specific distinction was not permitted um, under Title IX. So I, I believe that case settled. Um, but you can kind of see that that would show, okay, these are the types of implications that Title IX was applied. A lot of the, um, I think, sex-specific programming would be off the table. Um, I think there would be potentially some um, consequences to religious liberty as well, even though Title IX includes um, a religious exemption. It's, um, it's not a narrow exemption necessarily, but it's, it's not particularly broad in the sense that there's a lot of autonomy that, that would be lost. Um, and then, we're also starting to see some administrative interpretations um, similar to the district court's opinion here. Um, and I'm thinking specifically of a uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture case. It's, uh, I believe it's called Church of Compassion. And the U.S. Department of Agriculture is taking the position that um, an organization participating in one of the USDA's like food kind of poverty relief programs needs to disclaim or kind of narrow its statement of faith if it wants to continue participating in this USDA program. Um, so it's, it's not exactly analogous um, because it's not focused on 501c3 status, but it's an, I think it's a, it's a case that illustrates how um, there can be a conflict between an organization's religious identity, its understanding of its mission, and the regulatory and oversight that's triggered by um, participation in um, federal financial aid programs. Um, and then finally, I think there's, there's for years been this... Um, tension between organizations that, like the perspective that tax exempt organizations, civil society is autonomous, um, more or less. And then the view that civil society should be kind of subordinated to the government and um, subordinated to government policy and, and have a lot of, I guess, a lot of hands on um, guidance, so to speak. Um, and this is like, an I think, an installment in that kind of series. And so um, even if yeah, I, I think one of the biggest implications would be to kind of further um, to, to reduce the autonomy of tax exempt organizations in favor of like greater government oversight generally, um, even if it's not specific to exempt status, just to their operations overall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it seems like almost boundless effects, like it could lead to a lot more than what we're talking about today. But Thanks so much for just, you know, talking through this case. Um, we have a few listener questions, so I'll start going through those. Maybe we've already touched on them uh, as they've been coming in. But first question is, how similar or different do you see this in regard to the proceedings in EHV, Valley Christian Academy in California? So the case that you mentioned, uh, which had settled, but, you know, whether this case is similar or different, just how those work together and, and whether uh, this case has it or, or rather if they have any overlap? Um, I, I think that they're very similar cases. Um, I believe the biggest distinction would be that if, if I'm remembering correctly, I believe that Valley Christian Academy 
had a paycheck protection loan outstanding during the period where the conduct in question occurred. And so I think that the focal point of that litigation wasn't as much on whether 501c3 status taken alone would be enough to trigger the application of um, Title IX. So I I would have to double check. I We did not file an amicus in that case, so I'm, I'm only a little bit familiar with it, the specifics, but I, I believe that that was the distinction. Okay. Um, and then another question is, what was the Supreme Court decision reached in the most recent precedent listed? Um, I believe maybe that's Reagan that you mentioned. Yes. Um, so that case was um, Reagan versus um, taxation with representation. Um, and in that case, the, the Supreme Court held that the prohibition on, well, not prohibition on lobbying, but the limitations on lobbying by 501c3s and the prohibition on political campaign activity was not unconstitutional. Um, and the, the specific quote that I had pulled from that was, um, this is a 1983 case, and it was kind of dicta. It said, tax exemption has much the same effect as a cash grant to an organization of the amount of tax it would have to pay on its income. Um, so that was the holding. I, I, I do think that's considerable contrary authority that needs to be contended with. Um, but that I think that the court is not view it is not anchoring that view in any statute. It's not. So I, I think um, I don't think I guess it, it's precedent, but I, I think it's a little bit questionable in the sense that it's not tied to the to any legislation. Um, so it's it's a policy. From my view, it's a bit more of a policy perspective, and I think it could it could be challenged um, successfully. In in my view. Mm -hmm. Well, and this question also mentions uh, the members on the court at the time. So obviously, we have a completely different Supreme Court makeup right. now. I don't know if, if you thought about this at all, but a case like that, I mean, how would how do you think that might come out today, or is that something that we could consider as far as just you know if, if there is there are differences and you're able to distinguish it, what does that look like today? If it goes up to the court. Um, we have a we have much more robust church autonomy jurisprudence than we did ten years ago, certainly twenty years ago, and certainly thirty years ago when Reagan was decided. Um, so I I think that um, those autonomy arguments they're they're not exactly on point, but I think that they're relevant in suggesting how we're how um, our jurisprudence views civil society and religious organizations specifically. Um, and what um, what does um, appropriate government um, civil society interaction? What do they look? What do appropriate interactions between the government and civil society look like? And then when do we run afoul of entanglement um, entanglement clause issues? And um, I want to say we have an interesting case coming up. I believe it's like something like the Russian Orthodox Church, and it's an internal church governance um, issue in that case. But I I think all of these autonomy conversations. Um, they're not the same legal issue, but I do think they're indicative of, of how our jurisprudence is viewing civil society and religious organizations specifically, not just on issues of doctrine, but on issues of, gover issues of governance. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, um, next, the next question is, is there any reason to believe that the district court's 51C3 organization, oops, sorry, district court's reasoning rather, would not apply to organizations that are tax exempt under IRC provisions other than 501C3? That's a very good question. Um, yeah, let me let me think about this for a second. Um, well, um, I don't real I don't really think it would go that direction. I mean, the main distinction between a five hundred one c three and orgs that are exempt under other provisions of the tax code would, in most cases, that the exemption from income tax for the organization itself is that that those organizations have in common all all of the 501 uh, 501c's but um many mo most i believe if not all 501c3s um also are able to offer to their donors a tax deduction on the donor's own contribution so so there's sort of an incentive for support for 501c3s and that that's not present in other um that's not present for other tax classifications I that I actually looked for that in in the district court's two opinions, like whether they were making a distinction between the organization's income tax exemption and the deductibility of contributions to the organization. So kind of the income tax exemption for co contributors. 
but the, the court doesn't make um, any distinctions in its analysis between those two like facets of the exemption. Um, yeah. yeah. Do any so of the I, other cases make that distinction, discuss the distinction at all, or is that something that's just at this point unresolved? Um, it's not discussed in any of the amici, but I, I do think it's I do think it's kind of thought provoking. Um, mm -hmm. But I, in in both cases, I think that it would turn on whether an exemption is an expend a tax ex in a tax expenditure, mm -hmm. um, which a form of federal financial assistance. So I, I think the reasoning would be the same on both fronts. But I I think in the interest of precision, it, it's appropriate to analyze them separately, those two facets of five hundred one c three tax exemption. Mm -hmm. Um, well, the next question is, are the institutions that are in the crosshairs here only 501c3 organizations that are educational organizations? Are there any religious schools categorized as religious organizations instead? Um, and if so, does that make any difference? Um, there are a few yeah. questions going on there. <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's a really good question. Um, and I actually, it makes me want to go back to this, the um, the text of Title um, six, I think it is. Um, let me just take a minute and see if I can pull that up. Um, I I think title title nine specifically it's focusing on education, but I want to say um, let me just get the text of title seven as well. Um, yeah, title title um, six of the Civil Rights Act of nineteen sixty four. Um, its prohibitions um, apply to any program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So it's not limited to education. It would be any program or activity. So there's definitely an analogy there. Um, the statutory frameworks are separate. I, I think it's very important that we don't conflate them. Um, but, but courts often rely on, they're a little bit interdependent. If you look at the jurisprudence for both of those two statutes, like the, the jurisprudence is very interdependent. Um, whether it should be or not is kind of a separate issue. But um, so at the moment, I think the direct impact would be on educational organizations, but it would only take a couple opinions mm -hmm. um, to incorporate, to, to kind of analogize between the Title IX analysis here and the Title um, VI analysis for the purposes of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, has the Biden administration made any indication that it agrees that taxism status is federal financial assistance? Um, not to my knowledge, um, not to my knowledge. And what are some of the potential implications for higher education regarding student rights and due process? Um, so I, I don't think that higher education organizations would really be impacted as much because they are Typically, unless it's like we're talking just specifically about the one or two colleges that aren't receiving federal financial aid either through their students or directly, um, they they wouldn't be income impacted by the outcome of this litigation. Um, so so I think for the most part, higher education isn't really going to come into play here. It would it would just be like a um, like a Hillsdale College or there's I think there's one other college um, that's not receiving federal financial assistance but does have tax exempt status. So those would really be the only two that would be affected, and I. I guess, I mean, perhaps looking at their track record, maybe they would just forgo the tax exemption as well. Yeah, I think the, so the specific question here, and, and it sounds like it'd be very narrow if um, ever applied, but just whether that could impact the ability of students to sue a college like his, Hillsdale for a violation of due process. So do you know if that would have any impact? Um, I mean, that's that's a that would be outside of the scope of my area of focus, but I could sort of speculate and say no. Um, mm -hmm. Due process and that type of thing are, aren't implicated. It's it's really and and I think it's worth noting that all the litigation that we're discussing today is only one count of the five counts or one count of the of those raised by the students in this context. So the students' um, opportunity to have their wrongs or harms remedied isn't at issue, isn't being questioned. It's it's really just what um what are the venues or the legal basis through which they could um like kind of achieve or or litigate this, but it, their ability to litigate at all is certainly not in question. Okay. 
I think this next question may be a little bit outside of the scope of your um, role as an amicus in this case, but just in case um, you have any familiarity, uh, one questioner asks, did you seek initial en banc consideration of this case? Why or why not? More of a procedural question. Yeah, that's a procedural question, of course. I I, I don't know, but I do know in the, I, I've read the majority of the filings in this case, and I, I didn't see any requesting en banc. Um, but I, I don't, I don't know. If, I can't say for sure that that wasn't that that wasn't requested. Okay. Um, and are there any other federal appellate cases on this question? Um, on the question of whether federal five hundred one c three status is financial assistance, um, I, I think not. I think there are two district court cases that that held this back, as I said, in the seventies and eighties, but. On um, on this issue, I don't think there's any I don't think there's any contrary authority, and I think that there is favorable authority. Okay. Um, and then, so if the district court's opinion is affirmed, which federal agency would be responsible for enforcement? Do you know? Um, yeah, that's a good question, and it's a little bit probably a little bit out of my area of focus. But I could I know that the Department of Justice is the one that is implementing Title Nine. Um, in, so I, I assume it would probably be the Department of Justice in partnership maybe with the Department of Education. Um, yeah, that would be my expectation, but I, I don't know that for sure. Okay. I think we've hit all the questions in here. If others have any, you can add those in now, but just making sure we didn't miss anything. Yeah, but it looks like that really covers everything. I mean, um, this has been a great conversation so far. I don't know if you have any concluding thoughts um, as we wait and see if any other questions come in or just anything else you'd like to address. Um, well, I would I would encourage um, everyone listening to continue tracking this case specifically. And um, I, I would like to see more engagement just generally on um, on the tension we discussed between the subsidy theory and some other theories of exemption, just because I think um, as the culture becomes um, more polarized, some of these distinctions become less academic and much more practical. And so I think it, we would be um, we would be doing our duty to engage with those conversations now and um, make sure that that everyone's perspective is being heard as those um as these issues are being debated and resolved. Great. Well, thanks so much, Mayor Margaret. Thanks, think, Amanda. I think Kayla may uh, want to come back on in order to close this out. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time and giving us the benefit of your valuable time and expertise today. Uh, to our audience, we also thank you for giving us a portion of your afternoon and joining and participating. We welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. And as always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about other upcoming virtual events. With that, thank you all for joining us today. We're adjourned.